Howdy, howdy, howdy. How's everybody doing tonight? I have really been looking forward to this one. I've wanted to do something with uh, my guest tonight for quite a while. Uh, I think that uh, she is just an amazing person, has done an incredible job here in the SPTV. I call it a family. I don't even call it a community anymore. And I, I like I said, I am, I've been very excited about this. I'm not even going to do a play in for it. Let's just get Nora in here. <laughs> hey, Nora. Hey, how are you? Good. Like a kid in a candy shop, basically. <laughs> so. uh, it's, uh, I'm I've, happy to be here. I don't know. We've never like collabed. Like we've never done this in the well, YouTube verse. You for a long time. <clears throat> um, oh. I, I've been very open about it. My daughter is is in the LGBT community. She's been very open for some time. And I think that's one of the reasons why when I heard what was going on with Liz, I took it so personally. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm the kind of father that I feel that my job is not only to be an educator mm -hmm. and to mm -hmm. bring up people to be good human beings, but also to be a protector. So hearing Liz's story, it absolutely yeah. broke my heart. And, uh, you know, and then seeing the relationship that you and Liz have your and the friendship that you have going on there, it, you know, I've been wanting to work with you for a while. Oh. I, I love the work that you're doing and just the person that you are. So thank, thank you for you that. So very much. I really well, you been amazing also in this community and just bringing so much knowledge um to us you know that from your years of experience and everything and also that you know great fatherly protector uh vibe that honestly has been amazing for all Thank of you. us you know and i appreciate that so much as you know also a fellow member of a, a stripe in the <laughs> um in the lgbtq many other uh, it, it, every day there's another Form. Yeah. And I don't want to insult anybody by leaving out all of this. I, I, I always do. I leave somebody out and then I feel terrible. But like, yeah, I don't know. It's just plus. And I, I'm, I'm 55 years on. old. I can't keep up with all the added letters and, and everything that's going on. I, you know, so I, I just try I to blanket it and try to make sure everybody feels included. So. I, 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 you know, and that's why I try and remember. I, I, that's why I try and like tell my kids who are, you know, they're all teens now and they're telling me things. And I'm like, listen, in the nineties, when I was a teen, it was like, you were gay or you were straight and yep. lesbians were also gay. And then they were just like an icky kind of gay that people were like, gross, you know, like, it was yeah. just like that was it. I mean, in the nineties were, you know, it was a weird time, but it was just, you know, and there were trans people. And then that was like, you know, that was it. There was like three things and then straights, you know, yep. and, uh, and that's just, it was a different, it was a different time period, but I try to follow the Bruce Lee philosophy as much as I can of be like water and just try to move with the times, you know, um, because that's all you can do. You can't, you can't be a rock. And that, that's the thing yeah. is you, you have to be, you know, it's hard. I know it's hard for a lot of people who are in their seventies and eighties. They're just oh, not sure. so good with this kind of thing. And that's just simply because of the generation they grew up in and the way that things yeah. were looked at. But, you know, even at a young age, I'm, I've always been a creative and I have a, fa had a father that was very, um, he was a former green beret in Vietnam. Wow. Very hard man. And Mm -hmm. He had a lot of PTSI that came along with it, and he mm -hmm. took all of that out on me growing up. Um, yeah. You know, I, I've, I've talked about it many times. My back literally looked like a roadmap with all the scars he'd left on it from whip antennas, extension cords, things like that. Mm -hmm. And I just mm -hmm. knew that when I, from a young age, that when I become a father, the last thing I ever wanted my children to do was be in fear of me. Right. Uh, you know, my children respect me. Uh, I mean, honestly, I can look at my daughter and she'll start crying if she thinks that I'm upset with her. But I've never had to be in any way uh, aggressive towards them. They, right. uh, you know, and that's just simply you. There's a matter of respect in there that I, I think that all fathers should have to. They, they should have to live by. They should be able to love their children, show them a strong father figure without having to be abusive to them. Yeah. And it's, it, I, I really want to, you know, that's one of the things I've always wanted to move away from was the, the kind of father that I had and into a more, I, I would say, strong but gentle father. So, yeah. I mean, we're, we're from the same generation. We're both Gen X. I'm at yeah. the latter end of Gen X. 
Uh, so both of our dads were in Vietnam. So hooray for that. Yay for the Vietnam babies. Um, yeah. So it, my dad also, you know, um, he was a helicopter. Uh, he was in the helicopters. He was a medic. Oh, okay. In, um, so like he would, his, he, his parenting philosophy was much different than your dad's because he had grown up in a household like that. So mm -hmm. he was very like uh, laissez faire with punishment. Oh, okay. he was very like no punishment um, unless it was like super extreme moment where he had to like bring the hammer of Thor. I think he, he spanked me twice in my life. Uh, one time, I don't, that was not what I was trying to do, Apple. We're talking about spanking. Um, <laughs> the Mac just, like, does its own thing. Um, one time, because I was curious, I was, like, two, and there was, like, you know, some, like, uh, cleaner under the thing that I thought was, like, Ooh. grape juice. Yep. And, like, my mom wasn't letting me have, like, grape drink or something, you know? And she was, like, trying to tell me, like, this is going to make you sick. It was, like, the Pine Sol or something. And she she couldn't convince me to not drink it they used to call yeah. me no no nora when i was a kid right because <laughs> i was always like getting into stuff and like my dad just finally you know gave me a, a spanking the second time was a whole incident where i wasn't doing my homework and i was like that sass in my mom like big time oh, yeah. just you know and he tried to do like the whole like hey what's happening you know why won't you do your homework <laughs> pew, 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 finger gun and i was like i don't feel like it and and then he got like angry with me and yelled at me and told me to go to my room. And so I started crying and I was like, <laughs> and I picked up the phone because it was the eighties and they had started that whole like child abuse hotline. Oh. He, he had grabbed my arm and told me, you know, like to go to my room. And he was like, what are you doing? And I was like, I'm calling the child abuse hotline. And he was like, Oh yeah. And he hung up the phone and he, he, he really spanked me. He's like, I'm going to give you something to call about. And then he handed me the phone back. He's like, why don't you call him now? And I was like, no, it's fine. I'll just do that. You know? And that was like, but that's the 80s. Like, guys, like, oh, yeah. you can't do but things like that. That's not now. Like, you know, us 80s, 90s babies, we survived things that are just, you know, uh, after school special now that you can't, um, you can't do. I don't I don't think these these newer <laughs> generations realize just how unchildproofed our lives were back then. Oh my then. god. Uh, we had a proofing. What? Yeah, we had a, a Chevy Monte Carlo and I remember riding all oh the way god. back from Florida mm -hmm. on that ledge between the back seat and the back window. Yep. Laying up there the whole time. Yeah. You know, not to mention we didn't even have seat belts in the back seat back no, then. It's just it wasn't a thing and we all survived it and we're here. You know, and it's all good. I mean, it's just, um, but that's, I think that's why we became, at least a lot of us became um, helicoptery, you know, yeah. with our kids. We were like, we got to like protect them like they're gold bullion, you know, and like just like went overboard because our well, parents were like, oh, you guys are somewhere wonderful. Have fun. <laughs> I, I've always been, um, you know, I let my kids, one of the big things I like doing is I like introducing my children to different cultures, just different aspects. We spent yeah. probably every weekend when they are between the ages of five and 11 at mm. the Henry Ford museum, you know, Oh wow! took them to Toronto to see the lion King, all different things like that. And then, you know, of course their first time out of country, I took them to Tokyo, Japan. We spent two weeks over there. Wow! And, you know, I've been back with my children uh, several times since then, but I've always, you know, I wanted them to basically feel that they were free to express themselves and to look at the world. My my only requirements are is that you make sure you can take care of yourself, make sure you can pay your bills, make sure you can take care of anybody who's with you. Be a good person. Exactly. And that's, you know, uh, you know, my my son is is on the spectrum, so it's a little bit different for him Mine than too. it is. Yeah. But he's he's. Uh, He's doing really good. Absolutely. Just amazingly smart. I know. And, right. Like my oldest as well. He's, he's autistic and he's 18. He's got his first yeah. job oh, and he's, he's, he's really doing really well. We know uh, my wife and I know it's, it's a much longer road for him to full independence, you know, like right. moving out and doing the thing. So we're, we're laying the groundwork um, to get him to be, you know, fully independent that my, my only goal for any of my kids is to have a job that lights their hearts on fire and to be with someone who loves them for them 
and, um, you know, allows them to be fully themselves and they can do the same for their, for their partner, you know, um, whoever they, whoever they choose, you know, and, and that's really it. And that they have the means to, like you said, you know, take care of themselves, you know, and then, and then maybe me when I'm old and crazy, but you know, that's yeah. And I'm just (laughs) waiting. I want grandbabies. I want, I want to be that grandfather who just spoils the crap out of them, feeds them a ton of sugar and then unleashes them upon their parents. That's what I want to (laughs) be. I want to be that one that yeah. when, when they think back, like the way I think back about my grandparents, how much love and just how great of people they were to me. And right. I make no mistakes about it. I know that my my father's father was a complete a-hole. He was absolutely horrible to most people he dealt with, but he always loved me and he always treated me really well. And it seems like that, like my dad had such a bad experience with his, his stepfather who raised him after his father passed when he was eight. Okay. Um, all, everybody in the family, like just horrific stories about this man. However, asterisk, when he was the grandfather to like, and, and let me tell you something, they had to keep a ledger of the amount of grandkids. Okay. Like it's just nuts. <laughs> yep. a, a ledger of all of us grandkids, the best grandparents in the world. Absolutely. The best. That man, uh, hard as nails. When he told you it's this way and you tried to zag, he was going to let you know one time. And you oh, yeah. learned very early as a child that that discipline was going to come for you. And then our parents would just laugh, just cackle like, <laughs> now you're seeing oh, what we I got did. You, we got <laughs> you with the ruler. But instead of doing what they did their whole life, just keep challenging this guy. We were like, mm-hmm. oh, okay, we're not going <laughs> to. He said it. Yeah. We're going to do it. And then we had a good rapport this person right um but he was the kindest most gentle person like i when i blew from the sierg once i ended up at my grandparents house and i gave them a total so oh i'm on vacation and (laughs) um you know i just wanted to come see you while i'm on vacation and um my grandfather took me aside as i was leaving his house he said listen i don't know what's going on right now but i want you to know that no matter what we love you and if you need a place to stay, you can always come and stay with us no matter what. No That's... questions asked. And I just like, I broke. I broke oh, yeah. because he saw, he saw, he was never a Scientologist or anything. He just saw through me. Like mm-hmm. he knew that I was so full of it. <laughs> no. Yeah. That I was running away, that I was seeking help. And it just, that's one of those moments in my life where I wish I would have just been like, help me, Obi-Wan. You're my only hope. He would have, he would have, I mean, that guy is a World War II vet. He would have fought everybody tooth and nail, been like, oh, you're going to come to my house? I don't think so. Not on this chipper Tuesday. You know, like that would have just been the end of it. He would have. When my grandfather passed. Uh, World War II vet, combat wounded. And uh, when he passed, everyone was like, well, who's, you know, who's getting the flag? And my dad and mom were both like, oh, no, that's going to Johnny. <laughs> that's going to him. Yeah. And, you know, that that uh, what was really <clears throat> interesting is I never knew that my grandfather could read or write. He was this wow. Cherokee Indian. He had... Uh, I mean, when you think back, if you remember the old commercials where you see the someone throw something out the window and it turns to the Indian and the tear coming down his face. Right, right, right. That was how my grandfather looked. Wow. And, you know, the thing is, I never saw him reading newspapers. I never saw him writing. I never, saw, you know, he was either working or he was at home arguing with my grandmother. And <laughs> so I never knew that I never knew he could even read or write. And when I graduated from basic training in the army, we get, when you graduate, suddenly you get all the mail that had come for you while you were going through basic training. Right. And they came over and they literally handed me a box. And every day that I had been gone, my grandfather had sent a letter to me at Fort Dix, New Jersey. And it was amazing because sometimes it would literally just say, Hey, Johnny, just want you to know, I love you. And I'm proud of you. You know, and all my cousins, they're all like, that's not the papa we knew. And I'm like, that's the papa I knew. And right. I love that man. Yeah. He was, uh, and it was amazing. You know, people talk about, they're like, oh, you're, you're a big guy and all that. Please. I am the smallest man in my family. 
all the men in my family are six four or taller. My That's son crazy. pushing six foot seven. And you know, here I am at six foot two. I was the run of the of the litter there. <laughs> but he was this big, strong, and like I said, he was a very pronounced looking Cherokee Indian. Yeah. And but yet he was so gentle with me. And I, you know, there was I, I always felt loved on either side. That's you know, amazing. My mom was one of 13 children. Whoa. So we've got a whole crap load of us running through the hills of Eastern Kentucky. And uh, all I, I never met my grandfather on my mom's side. He had passed away long before I was born. Um, mm. One of the gifts of being a coal miner was the beautiful black lung that they gave. Oh, them. yeah. <clears throat> That's and, a present. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, so I never, never got to meet him, never knew about him. Uh, but the my grandmother and we we had a name um, on dad's side it was Mammal Sugar and on mom's side it was Mammal Honey. And I love it. So, but all I remember she was this gentle, soft spoken woman that it all you felt was love around her. And the best way I can describe it is when I worked with Rosa Parks. I got the same kind of feeling from Rosa Parks that I got from my grandmother. There wow. was, was this woman who was petite, very frail looking, very soft spoken, but there was such a power that resonated through her. It was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so that's, you know, people ask me about, you know, working with Rosa Parks, how it was. And all I keep thinking about is how much she reminded me of my grandmother and how much I just adored her. Yeah. And, you know, I, you know, it's it's crazy because I've had people go, oh, you're afraid of women. I'm not afraid of women. I respect women. Yeah. And some of the most powerful people I've ever met in my life have been women. So, yeah. you know. <laughs> I believe that. I mean, my wife is one of the most powerful people I know. So, I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm with you on that. And so, yeah. Yeah. My list goes <clears throat> uh, my wife, my mother, my grandmother, and now my daughter. Those are the most powerful people I know. Yeah. And, uh, you know, nothing but love and respect for all of them. I, I wouldn't be who I am without them. So, yeah. you know, it's just the crazy thing. So, uh, so much going on these past couple of weeks. Yes. How's it been for you? It's been a wild ride, John. Yeah. It's been, um, yeah, it, there's been some wildness, you know, and I'm not that quiet. So, you know, no. I've been stirring, what? I've been yeah. stirring the pot a little bit. You know, everybody's uh, a little up in arms and I, I don't know. Did you have a chance to see Jamie mustard on uh, down the rabbit hole today? Well, he's coming on Sunday night with, me. Oh my God. Okay. Well, so I didn't want to go discussion. too deep with it. Yeah. Um, we're, yeah. You, uh, it, it was so good because yeah. I'll just say this, like I addressed the Mike Rinder aftermath situation and I addressed mm -hmm. Mitch Brisker yesterday and a little bit today. I um, saw that. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I will say that what Jamie went over on rabbit, and I'm sure he's going to go in, in depth with you on, on a bunch of things, which I'm really excited that he's coming on your show. Um, first of all, Jamie is amazing. Yes. Um, and he's uh, been so vocal recently um, in helping Miriam mm -hmm. and in helping just the community at large. Uh, I, I'm very interested. I, I I didn't know he had a book until all this kerfluffle happened. And I'm like, now yeah. I got to get the book. I had I'm no idea excited. who he was. He, he's, you know, because he he is not contrary to popular belief, he's not a shit stirrer, you know, uh, extraordinaire like he's being painted right now. Or um, because he's speaker. been right. No, he's been very quiet, mm -hmm. other than basically, you know, declaring, okay, once things, you know, came <laughs> out and were oh. That's my package. Oh, well, that's all right. My wrath goes no. loud like that's, that. So. That's well, the, the the UPS guy got, just rang the door. Guys, somebody get my package. And so um, uh, the dogs are going crazy. Um, but, um, you know, uh, when the Tampa Bay article came out, he, you know, vocally said, okay, I'm not, I can't sit with Scientology anymore. This is bad sauce. Mm -hmm. And of course, like everyone else who publicly says, Scientology is not my jam, uh, right. instantly lost family, friends, you know, et cetera, Absolutely. hundreds of people, um, literally, you know, in an instant gone from his life and, um, disconnection is still alive and well, they still mm -hmm. do that. Um, and, but well, even look at any of the new, new people that are blowing. Oh it's, yeah. 
Yeah. So don't tell me that fair gaming and I mean, look what happened to Reese. Yep. You know, um, so it's just, um, you know, the the thing about it is, is that um, when you speak out and you speak the truth, then it, it, it doesn't backfire and you actually get set free, which is the good news. Right. But it is a loss. It is a huge, tremendous loss. I mean, when I got declared, um, I received hundreds of messages simultaneously, basically wow. telling me it, some politely, some very spicily to, yeah. you know, piss off. And um, I cried for days. I, you know, these were people I that I had known um, my whole life, some of whom I had been through a literal hell with, mm -hmm. um, you know, and when you, when you have that ripped away from you, because you're just telling literally the stories that happened with that person, <laughs> You know, like as it happened, um, it's really hard to deal with. But I, yeah. I find the treatment and everything um, that he's worked with scientists with, because there's a lot of misinformation going on, too. Absolutely. Um, you know, that he helped, you know, develop this with scientists and it, people who had already been testing this out on the military and other people. He's helping to elevate that along uh, with his book and stuff. Um uh, but he explains it way better than I could. So I'm going to let him thank you. Just leave it. Thank you. That, that's why I, that's why I want to go into it cold with him because oh, I want him to explain yeah. it for me. No, to I'll let you, him. but I just, yeah. you know, it, it, somehow he was trying. It's like every time there's a kerfluffle, we have to have a villain. Right. Oh, yeah. So I, so I brought up all this stuff about Mike and Mitch, and now we have to have a new villain on the scene. Right. Because mm -hmm. no one's going to come for me. Apparently I'm super scary. Right. Like I am just too much to deal with because I'm going to come at you with policy and receipts. So they're not going to yeah. deal with me. So now all of a sudden it's Jamie Mustard is the boogeyman. And it's like yeah. he's not a boogeyman. He's been exceptionally quiet. The only reason he's poked his head out is because of Miriam, um, because this woman did not get. She's not getting with. what she needs. She's not getting what she needs. And that's really, you know. The times where I have gotten, you know, the mama bear extra spice and in, in mm. recent times has come out for me speaking out against particular members in the, the community in fighting. It's being called and all these other things um, is, uh, you know, I find it to be necessary because half truths are being told Absolutely. right and and jamie did something on rabbit show which i i try to do but he did it more beautifully than i did um where he acknowledged mike and leah's work on the aftermath show Absolutely. because people people get confused about the aftermath show leah, leah remini scientology in the aftermath that's the whole title and the aftermath foundation these two things have nothing to do with each other Absolutely. Okay. So everybody, in case you didn't know that, the the foundation was formed after the show. And it was Leah's not on the board. She's never been on the board. Mike was on the board. That's the only connection between the two things is that Mike Render was on the show and Mike Render was also on the board. But and it was the word aftermath is in both things, which they really shouldn't have done. But that's my personal opinion. Um, and it, it, Jamie credited the show for doing something that it really did do. And I will do the same thing that they took the word Scientologist and took it out of the circus freak show side piece title and made it part of the zeitgeist yeah. because of, because of that show and because of the definitions and educating the public on Scientology in general, but also the horrors of what went on there. Um, you could say to somebody, oh, I grew up in Scientology and they'd be like, oh my God, I saw Leah Remini's show. Yeah. Oh my God, that's crazy. You know, and then it would become a conversation instead of like, oh, mm, Ooh, well, gross. nice knowing like, you. Yeah, like, mm, yeah. right. And so, yes, but Kids, you don't play with Norris kids, anymore. right? It's, yeah, pretty much, pretty much. I mean, it's and it, it for that that is super important because without that show, that doesn't happen. That right. doesn't happen like at all. And but I have to, I have to, you know, I, I've said it before. I think that 
had it, and I, I, I said it on one of my live streams, had it not been for Leah and Mike, a lot of people that are in this community would not be here, Correct. would not know about Scientology, would not know about the abuses. I mm -hmm. give them 100% credit for that. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm, but I've got to say, as of late, actions that have happened have severely changed my opinion, especially for Mike. Mm -hmm. I didn't know much about Mitch, but I, my, as being a friend of Marilyn and, yeah, you know, like with you, I have that Papa Bear mentality and mm -hmm. what's been happening with Marilyn. And then the fact that I've had so many people have been trying to handle me as well. So it doesn't do, it doesn't work. No, uh, and it's it, the the other problem with the formation of the aftermath thing, and this is something that we've all been bringing up, is that you take, you know, Mike, Claire, um, Mark to some extent, Amy Scobie, Matt Pesh, you take these characters in the overall Scientology arching story. These guys were people with supreme power mm -hmm. and were people who were to people like myself, like Serge, like Mike Brown, like other people who were lower, who were doing the, the jobs. We were in terror of these people. Absolutely. Their name would make the hairs on the back of your head stand up. Like people see Mike, you know, Mike Rinder right now, and they just see the Papa Smurf persona mm -hmm. and the nice ties and the haircut and this fatherly attitude. And it's like when we knew that Mr. Rinder was coming to our org, we were in sheer terror. When we knew that Mr. Scobie was coming to our org, no one was excited. She was not nice. She was not this queen bee, happy, go lucky, you know, Absolutely. Claire was not nice, right? There were times in the before times before she became an RTC rep where she was nice. And once she became an RTC rep, that was gone. That Claire was non-existent. Okay. So it, it, it is, it was a mistake to think that putting that cast of characters to then tell people who are leaving the Sea Org, who have left Scientology, these are the people who are here to help you. That right. is like, it, it, you know, everyone likes to make Nazi comparisons and like mm -hmm. all this other stuff. But, you know, uh, it, it, it would be similar to like taking a prisoner out of a jail, okay, and then having the guy who was the jailer start a charity and be like, I've got, I'm going to help you get a job. And this is the guy who would like lock him up in his cell every night. Like yep. it would be like that. And then you're just supposed to like see this guy with regular clothes on mm -hmm. and just be happy to see him. And like, he's going to give you a hug now. And he's just Mr. Nice guy. And you're like, what? You're still having nightmares. Like, you know, I, I kind of look at it like can't. when, um, what's his name? Uh, Draco in Harry Potter right. <laughs> in that last movie where Voldemort comes up and Draco, give me the hug. And he's putting his arms around and you could tell Draco's just like, I ain't having this. Right. Right. In the last week, I've got to talk to three amazing people and it all came through. And I got to thank Marilyn for this because she's the one who basically started the, the conversation. I got to talk to Miriam. Then I, well, four people actually. Miriam is. Oh my gosh. She's one of the strongest Miriam. people on the universe. Absolutely. So oh, I'm going to get into she. She's amazing. And then I got I got to talk to Mike Brown first and mm -hmm. then Jamie Mustard and then mm -hmm. Miriam. Uh, Jamie actually introduced me to Miriam. Mm -hmm. And the resounding thing that I kept hearing between the three of them was the whole point that you were just making. Here are the people who were known for being the, the doomsdayers in Scientology. When they came, it was never going to be a party. It was always going to be an S storm. Yeah. And now that you're out, you basically have to get on bended knee in front of these people and mm -hmm. beg them to help you. And I've had so many people who've been emailing me. And one of my big things is someone tells me something in confidence. I don't break that confidence. Of course. 
you know, I can skim over what has been said, but I'm getting a lot of com uh, communications from people that are talking about, I came out, but when I found out who was in charge of the Aftermath Foundation, I was terrified. Yeah. yeah. It's, it, so. it, it, does, it makes total sense to me that people would leave and then just be like, well, that's not a safe place for right. me to ask for help. And that's, and, and, and listen, I, you know, there were times where like, you know, it was very public when I was getting uh, beaten up online here oh, uh, yeah. by, by, by a, my own personal uh, troll. Um, mm -hmm. you, you guys all know who he is. Oh, he's know? focused on many people. Oh yeah, so. he but he made like over uh I, oh, I lost count, but it was like 120 videos that okay, I, some I of them have right me there. in the title. I am yeah. so surprised when I showed my daughter the yeah. things that he was doing. Yeah. And she said, Oh, I got some people I'm going to turn these over to. Oh, I'd love. And nothing has happened to this guy. No, I have I went to the police here locally in Oregon and I went to the courts. The police told me I, I sent them you know, screenshots. I sent them videos. I said all these things. They're like, there's nothing we can do. It's not stalking. I was like, I'm sorry, ma'am. They even sent me like a female police officer. I was like, ma'am, we're talking about over a hundred videos in this many right. months. How is this not stalking? Like, how is this not fit? The well, you know, there's nothing we can do is another state and blah, blah, blah. It's online. I'm like, this is the year 20 at the time. It was 2023. I said, this is the year 2023. This is how people do stalking now. It's yep. like ruining my life. They were like, no, no. So then I go to the court. I fill out the paperwork. Before I could say one word, the judge was like, nope, nothing I can do. He doesn't live here. I was like, sir, like Oregon law basically says that you can file for a protective order even if your stalker lives in another state. Absolutely. He was like, nope, yeah. nope, 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 nope. And, I, and, problem, I, and I, I can tell you from a law enforcement standpoint is that if I get a call from here in Michigan, fortunately, we have a, a system where certain states we work with like mm -hmm. ohio indiana wisconsin but if someone if uh, someone called me from oregon and said hey i've got a ppo or a restraining order whatever they right. call it where you live um i've got a, per, a restraining order against this person i need it served on them or i need them to be notified they need to stop what they're doing and go forward with some kind of criminal charges on it I, my response is, sorry, we don't respect anything out of Oregon. It's not right. a state that we're going to be dealing with. However, what could have been done and what the Oregon law enforcement should have done is if someone had used your name here in Michigan or in California or somewhere else, they can take an actual physical report for identity theft or fraud used right. through electronic conveyance, which is the Internet. And then they forward that to the agency where that person lives because right. the crime didn't happen where you live. It happened where they did it. Exactly. So they should have been able to take that report and forward it on from there. And then that local agency should have done something about it. But, yeah. you know, and it, it all comes down to where, what state you live in. And that's going to be a big problem with that. Yeah. And it's just, it, it, it also, you know, because the, the internet's, um, are still like, you know, even though it's been around since the 90s and people have been using it now 30 years, it's still right. in its infancy and things like this. And, and, and as a former law enforcement uh, you know, person, you can speak to this more coherently than I can. But these these type of crimes and these type of things are so dynamically changing all the time. Absolutely. Uh, like I used to work in cybersecurity and like things on the back end for a telco. So it's like every day something is new every week there's a new way that people are like creeping around getting oh, yeah. into hardware software all this stuff that it is so it, it, it boggles the mind well that, every time there's a step forward in technology mm -hmm. there's always that dark side where they're learning yes. how to break that technology yes to use it yes. for their own needs <laughs> One of the big new ones now is, you know, they used to have the thing where you go up to the gas pump and they would have that fake card reader on there. Put your card in, it would go through that and read it, and yep. then it would go into the real card reader. Well, yep. now one of the things that they're working, that they're doing is they have a setup, they're even doing it on ATMs now, mm -hmm. where they put a fake tap and go on there. Yeah, that's well, even worse. Yep. and Because it that's holds the screen real. open. Yep. And they can, they literally, they wait around the corner, watch you come up, tap, go into your account. Then it looks like everything's good. You walk away, they walk up. And the next thing you know, they're, they're going in there and they're 
draining your account for you. It took everything. So, yeah, it's yeah. it's nuts. It's uh, it, the 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 way this technology stuff and cybercrime moves. I mean, my kids think I'm nuts because I, like I have RFID blocking like everything. Right. And I won't let my kids have Android phones. And they're like, you're just that's mean. And I'm like, no. Number mm -hmm. one, it's way too hackable. And, you know, like I make them get certain things and I keep up on all these things um, right. because I have to. Not not necessarily uh, because I'm obsessed. I am obsessed a little bit with technology. But right. um, but also, you know, bear. yeah. But also, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm a total tech nerd on the side. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, you have to be aware of these things. And, right. you know, in, in regards to what happened to me, it was like, you know, no one did anything from the aftermath. No one from the aftermath came to me and was like, hey, are you okay? Do you need right. something? Do you need like some backup on this? Like, is anything going on? And then like, I had like a literal break and then it was like, I get a call. Okay. We have some resources for you. Like I lost a job. I was, you know, think I, I found another job because I'm resourceful. I'm never right. two seconds away from getting a job because I'm very hireable. That's not a problem for me, but I, I quit, you know, I, I, you know, I left the job that I had, even though they were promoting me because he doxed me online, was calling my place of work. And it just, I was like, I'm not safe here. Like, I don't, I, I felt unsafe. I probably in hindsight overreacted and I probably was safe, but I felt so incredibly unsafe right. um, in my own life that I, I fled. Um, you know, and that's, that's a trauma response. That's, uh, you know, uh, all kinds of things. And that's stuff I'm working through with my therapist and <laughs> all the other things, but Wait no one that's, should... that's out tech, isn't it? Out <laughs> what are you doing? So, yeah, I see a psychiatrist guys, watch out. <laughs> um, you know, but it's like, no one should ever be made to feel that way, to feel that unsafe. And when I did talk to the aftermath, like I didn't accept funds from them because I never felt good about that. There wasn't, you know, um, I still would have had to apply um, to get anything. And that's fine. That's a standard process um, to get funds from a charity. But they gave me some resources. A person who was a therapist who basically told me, I'm not your therapist. Please don't tell me your life story. I will help you find a therapist in your area that takes your insurance, which was completely unhelpful to me because right. no one they gave me as a referral was accepting patients. And it didn't no one called me back. The other person they gave me as a resource was like somebody to judge my resume who I had one session with. Um, I was kind of jazzed about that. I was like, oh, good. Like somebody's going to look at my resume and help me judge it up. Perfect. And then they never called me back until like two weeks after I'd already found a job and was like working. So it yeah. was not really helpful resources, you know, to somebody who was in a, in a mental health crisis and like severely out of work. So it, and it wasn't even because it was mostly because I had texted Leah and not because I was complaining to Leah. I, this is my number one policy. I don't pull the mama Leah card, right. right? Leah had encouraged me to go to law enforcement and to go to the courts because she was, this is at the beginning of her case. And she was like, the more people, you know, we have with cases, this could be great. And I was like, okay, I got your back. I, I'll, I, I'm, I'm trepidatious. I don't think it's going to work but I'll try it. So I had done these things and my text to Leah was basically like, I failed and I'm a failure and I've let mm. you down and I feel like a total POS and I'm so sorry. And you're so busy. And like, I, you know, I, I don't know what to do. And I, like, you know, it was a bit of a dump and I like, I apologize for dumping on her. And I said, don't want you to fix anything. I just, I feel really bad that I let you down. And like that in the moment when the judge dismissed me, that was my, literally my first thought is that I had let my friend down and that like, I hope me going to this tiny courthouse in Oregon hadn't somehow created a butterfly effect right. for Leah. Because I think I, that they, that'd be I, the last thing that I would want to do. Right. I think that Leah uh, of anybody realizes that there's going to be hurdles in this whole thing. Right. Right. And, you know, let's be honest, most judges 
are ready to start taking social security. They're so old that they're, they're, they have no idea about technology. Yeah. They have, none of them are really educated on fair gaming disconnection. No. The things that are happening within Scientology. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I talk about it a lot of times people are like, well, why don't we get the education out to law enforcement? And a lot of people have to realize, like when I was chief of police for the city of Luna Pier, I had a very tiny budget and right. I had a choice, get training for, pay for training for cult, uh, cults and how that they work, get training for my guys to know how to handle domestic violence. I have no connection with cults in, in that town. I've never dealt with Scientology in my job as a law enforcement officer. Right. Which is going which is the one I'm going to use my resources. That's a, on. that's a no-brainer for your yeah. jurisdiction. That's a no-brainer. Yeah. And then you know. you know, a lot of people ask about that. And I've been wanting to work with some folks to create a training program that would be free to law enforcement, whether it be through some kind of YouTube setup where you could go online, get these videos. Cause I've written three different training programs here in the state of Michigan that have been certified by the state so that we could train officers in them. And I can take th that knowledge and build a training program that can work here. And hopefully we can use that same outline to build training programs that can go nationwide. So you have these departments and you say, Hey, look, we've got this training program for you. It's free. Your officers are going to be happy for the fact that they're going to get another certificate for their personnel file that they can put up on their wall and you don't have to worry about it. And it's something you may come across with because we have yeah. no idea how many former Scientologists are living in small communities no. that are being quiet about things. Oh, yeah. well, there's there's thousands of them. Mm -hmm. There's thousands of them because most people who leave Scientology don't ever say a peep. They, they they say nothing. And so like a lot of times people say, you know, why are you so cranky about this and cranky about that and talk about these things? And I, I said jokingly to, uh, you know, a friend of mine the other day is I speak for the trees because right. there's so many of us who are out and have left Scientology quietly uh, for years, decades, some uh, who cannot speak out. Absolutely. And the reason why they can't, um, they're still uh, they're divorced but they have partial custody of a child. So if they were to be like, well, Scientology is poop -a doodles um, they would never see their kid again. They would, that's it. They would just, the kid is toast. So they're not going to risk that. I would never ask as a parent, somebody to like say about Scientology so that they lose a chance to be with their kid, especially somebody who's being an active parent. Absolutely. Right. Um, you know, uh, the same thing goes for people who are connected to their parents still. Um, the same thing goes for, you know, any family, friend connections. Or sometimes people have maintained their job at a Scientology-owned company mm -hmm. where they're making the money they need to make in oh, yeah. order to survive. So do I think, you know, maybe put your resume together. It's 2024. Like, get a different job. Sure. But some people, like myself, um, I did no go to college, okay? Mm -hmm. So, like, I didn't have that opportunity. Uh, my college years were spent in, in the C organization and on the RPF. Um, and then I bounced around from various Scientology-owned businesses after the C org, which is what a lot of ex C org <coughs> members do, okay? Right. Um, and, and that's how they keep you quiet also, is that you, you stay in the cult sphere, right? Like even if you're not going to go back and do more Scientology, what they do is they take the XC or guys, especially, and they, they grab you up because these Scientology business owners know, Oh, that guy, that guy's going to work 15 hours a day. He's not going to question how much I'm paying him or how Absolutely. I'm paying him. If I'm taking taxes out or anything else, he doesn't know nothing about nothing. And he's going to take whatever pay I give him because all us little XSO members, we had never heard of, you know, like a living wage. We'd never heard of a minimum wage. Break time, right. Break time. Break time. What's that? 
Right. And then, you know, I was saying that on my my live, I think it was last night I was talking about it. You know, a lot of people, they want to hear about the whole, they want to hear about the RPF, things right. like that. And it shocked quite a few of the people that I've had on that I've been talking to. And I say, what is something positive you took away from Scientology? Mm. And one of the biggest things a lot of them tell me is it's my work ethic. I will work long, hard hours. I'm driven and I'm loyal to who my employer is. And I see that with a lot of the exes that are out there as they're out there, they're working their butts off. They're doing a great job and you, you can't stop them they're, They just, they just keep trucking right along with everything. And I think that's. And, that's, and, yeah. and only in approaching 50 now mm -hmm. I have, and through the wisdom of my wife who reminds me that I'm a human um, and I deserve uh, breaks and humanity that I have realized that that work ethic hasn't rewarded me right. um, in kind ever, not once. My loyalty to a brand, to a company, mm -hmm. to a boss, to anybody um, has 0% paid off for me ever. And I have worked extra hours. I've come yep. in early. I've stayed late. I have worked injured, sick tired, uh, you know, all of those things. And at the end of the day, and this is what I try to explain to my kids, um, you're replaceable. Absolutely. Your work ethic means nothing because eventually somebody's going to come in who they just vibe with magically and they get promoted above you. Absolutely. And then you know, you're training that guy and you're I like, what? When I talk to my kids and I tell them, do not put your loyalty in corporations. Corporations don't look at you as anything more than a number. And I think 100%. a great story of that, my wife's uncle left high school. Three days after he left high school at 18 years old, he went to work for U.S. Steel in the city of River Rouge, Michigan. He spent the next 30, I think it was 38 years working for U.S. Steel. Wow. Never took a vacation. Never took a sick day. Oh my God. Worked doubles all the time. This guy worked his butt off. Absolutely 100% committed to the company. Retires, has a real good pension because he's never used any of his time. They decide, okay, well, we're filing bankruptcy. The United States government comes in and they go, oh, by the way, you now have gone from four or $5,000 a month in pension. You now get $1,600 a month. And he's like, what? How's he going to oh. live off that? Yeah. And they say, oh, and by the way, you don't have medical benefits anymore. He goes, what do no. I do? What, what if I do if I get sick? And they go, well, there's Medicare. And That's not the same. No. And a lot of people, I, I try to tell this to my children. You have to be able to start making sure you're taking care of you if anything happens. Because mm -hmm. these companies won't do it. <clears throat> My my wife just found that out. She's been working with one company through her courier service for 10 years now. Someone, there was a clinic that she was going to. And when you work with veterinarians, you find that there are a lot who work out of their home. Yeah. Well, there's this one. And you, literally, we go up, we go up to these metal boxes, unlock them, pull the samples out that have to go to the lab. Mm. And then at the end of the day, we take them to the lab. Well, there's one and it's on the nighttime route that you have to go around the side of their house. You have to literally duck under a tree and it's up on a fence and there's no lighting there. They never clear off the walkway. It's always icy in the winter time. And so she, she literally, she left a message. Hey, I'm just wondering if you could do this for, for us to make it a little bit more safe yeah. that way that I'm not going out there in the dark walking up to this box and I don't know if anybody's around that person called in through a complete fit about it. What's the company do? They turned around and they canceled her contract. And so here it is. She'd spent in the last two weeks before that she had worked doubles every day, put 2,900 miles on the car in two weeks. That's crazy. And then they just brush her away. Anytime she ever needed anything, she was there doing it. Right. And she helped out the company, but they don't care about her. No. And that, that's the thing is I, I, you know, 
anybody who's wanting to get into something nowadays, make sure you you have your IRAs. Make sure you go into a self-funded 401k. Make sure you're putting that money to the side so that yeah. when the retirement time does come, then you're you're more uh, financially set. For me, fortunately, you know, working with government agencies, I have a government pension. I have mm -hmm. government medical care. Mm -hmm. That's something that doesn't just walk away. But, no. the, you know, the fact <laughs> is. First is, that, is amazing. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, a lot of people wonder about why police officers have good pensions, why we have good medical benefits <laughs> on retiring. That's because when people were coming home from World War II, there was this mass influx of people who now needed work. Well, the majority of them were going into factories. These cities were like, we need good, dependable law enforcement officers. Mm -hmm. So these folks coming out of the Marine Corps, the Army, these guys, these folks would be a great fit. And they're like, but we can't pay them the pensions that Ford, GM, and Chrysler are paying. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to give them a good pension and give them good benefits when they retire. Yeah. And, you know, over the years, there's been this big push. Well, cops make too much on retirement. Cops have too good a, a medical plan. And they've been dialing that back. They never look at the fact that we went seven years in my first department without getting a pay raise. Oh, my gosh. You know, but it was all on the basis of we were going to have this great pension when we retired. Yeah. And that that was the thing. You know, I'm out there. My I, I can't tell you how many paychecks I had my first three years on the job where it, we got paid two weeks at a time. So they would be 80 hours regular time, 80 hours overtime. I was literally living at the police department and people don't think about that. And then you add into it the fact of the PTSI that comes along with that, the absolute yeah. horror that I've seen as a law enforcement officer, all these things building up on top of it. And then to tell me you don't deserve a good pension. You don't deserve benefits when you retire. You know why everybody else, if I go work for Ford, I'm guaranteed it. If I go to work yeah. for GM, I'm guaranteed it. Why can't I have that guarantee now that I've put my life on the line? I've been stabbed. I've been beaten uh, half to death. I can't tell you how many times. Wow. And every day I got right back up and walked myself right back into that job with that badge on my chest because I wanted to make my community safer for my family and for every family that was in that town. And, yeah. you know, so don't depend on, on, Folks do not depend on corporations. They they care yeah. about their stockholders. They don't care about you. So, all right, enough of me grandstanding. Um, <laughs> one of the things You're I wanted good. to talk to you about. Okay, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about. Can you explain to us yes. dead agency, dead agent forms? Yes. So, dead agenting in, in a nutshell is you take the the situation or the person that is giving you a problem or is attacking, right? And you create a load of information about that person or a group or a situation that shows truth um, to make anyone who would try to align themselves with that person or group or idea think twice change their mind because now you're showing them why this person, idea, group, entity is actually bad news bears, right? So you're you're literally killing them dead in the water right. by supplying all this information, right? And I brought up that um that policy that is an OSA internal policy um because that's essentially what Mike did with his post. Yeah, and it yeah. is something that um, is being practiced openly um, still by people like, you know, Mitch Brisker tried to do it with Serge Del Mar and pass around this, you know, secret information right. that now we're all supposed to have bad ideas about Serge Del Mar, you know, and it's like, this is the year 2024, like we're also, we have the playbook. I have the whole OSA playbook. I could go page by page and break it down and translate it. And we could just go page by page and we could review many posts and blogs and things and 
I think it would, you know, be a whole thing. But my my intention very carefully was to break down that singular blog post mm -hmm. about Miriam and kind of the entire situation that was going on with Miriam because I found it to be very upsetting and and really just in bad taste. And it had happened a bit, um, you know, with Aaron in the past, but Aaron had already addressed it. Also, Aaron's a, you know, he's a grown ass man and he had created a situation on his own in his adult life that he addressed and handled. Um, you know, and a lot of times people come at me, why don't you talk about this and that with Aaron and you've known him and burp, burp. okay. I'm not his wife. I'm not his mom. I'm not uh -huh. his PR agent. Uh, you know, we are friends. This is very true. And we have disagreements about a lot of stuff because we don't think alike about everything. Right. Um, but we handle that in private with conversations. Uh, I don't make videos about that disagreement, right? I make videos when someone is being attacked in public to break down why they're being attacked, how Scientology is being used to attack that person by someone who's saying, I'm an ex-Scientologist and I'm here to help you, but they're still using Scientology to attack another ex-Scientologist. That I can't abide by. That is, we're just not going to play that game in 2024. So yeah. for me, you know, Mike's back is up against a wall right now. <clears throat> for what reason? I don't know. Because I don't want to speculate and everybody's like, oh, he knows everything. Like, I don't know. Either, either he told Miriam, there, there's two possible scenarios, right? And as a law enforcement person, you can tell me maybe I'm missing a scenario. But when he told Miriam to her face, you've got to come to our show. Your case could break Scientology. Either he knew all about what had happened to her and was ready to expose all that and thought this stuff really could bring down a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But was going to craft the narrative very, you know, thread the needle so that he's not going to be implicated. Or it was a bunch of hype to get somebody on a show. Now, wow. there is hype to get people on reality shows. I will say this. Oh, absolutely. Um, having worked on two different reality shows, um, it, it, there's definitely editing and things that go into the narrative and this will go good with this story and like that. Yep. Um, however, I will say on, on, you know, on Leah's show in particular, they really just tried to um, do the interviews and then put imagery together with the interview to explain that person's story with as little fanfare and altering as they could right? Uh, going along with what the lawyers said, you can air this. Okay. Well, my, um, my which was hard. I've worked with animal planet, national geographic, oh, wow. and a couple of other teams. And I tried to explain last night in my life. What a lot of people don't realize is sometimes you'll film eight hours worth of content, but you'll get 30 seconds of it on the right? air. And they have not just the fact of there will be a lot of dead spots that they have to cut out of things, but mm -hmm. they also have a time restraint in how much information they can put out in these episodes. Exactly. So, you know, and, and that's for editors, producers, and directors. They're the ones who are making those decisions behind the scenes that you'll never have a hand in. You know, you could yeah. tell them, I would really like to get this point out there. And they're going to look at it and they're going to say, what is going to keep the audience riveted the most? And then they're going to edit down to that. Exactly. So. Exactly. Because I think a lot of people make the mistake of lumping in the aftermath show with like the Kardashians, right? Yes, it's all reality TV. However, asterisk, the, the aftermath show was a docu-series essentially about real life stories um, of, of people escaping this cold. Whereas the Kardashians and these other things that like sprung out from like the MTV, you know, real life, uh, you know, uh, era it, it is, it's, <laughs> um, it is like a whole other bag of chips where it oh, is yeah. tightly scripted. It is Absolutely. very much, um, the drama is created editing shows stuff. Like, um, I revealed the other night that I'm part of bachelor nation nation. And a, a couple of people were like, I cannot believe you watch the bachelor. Like I do have to watch some, 
uh, you know, trashy TV to just like alleviate space in my mind of, of things sometimes because the noise gets a little noisy and like I can oh, yeah. watch some trash. I've watched so much the weird trashy relationship TVs, um, but I love it. It makes me, um, you know, just think, but you can see sometimes where they edit things out of order and you're like, oh, yeah. Guys, that clearly took place the day before, and now you've put them here, and it, it's for the story evolution. And you're like, mm, "That's why is it's they're wearing different outfits during the right. same argument?" What's right? going on there? Yeah. yeah. So it's just it, but that was not That's done cool. on Leah's show. I know there's been, you know, people try and like oh, make yeah. up all these things. Was the show perfect? No. Is any show perfect? I don't know. That's a, that's a question for cinephiles, but um. Okay. I think their intention with the show was pure. Um, but do I think that, um, you know, there's question marks about what, what does Mike know? Was Miriam, you know, emotional when she asked those 16 questions? Sure. A hundred percent. Would I be emotional? And I've said this before. If I were Mike's lawyer, I would have said, don't, don't you dare answer those questions. That's crazy. Absolutely. But, no comment or just no response also would have been just fine. And that's what normal people would have done. And none of us are normal because we are cult survivors whose brains are mush because we have been programmed by a cult. But what is and normal? Honestly, that I can't answer that. Yeah. I can't answer John. I don't we know, but, but because yeah. of our programming though, John, it's like you can't, it, there's so much reactiveness in here. And I've done a lot of therapy and meditation and yoga and reflectiveness to work on like calming that. Do you know what I mean? Yep. And if you haven't done that, if you haven't done the therapy work, you're still in that mindset. And that's what we were seeing from Mike in that blog post and in the moment when he screamed at me and the other things and stuff like that. Because when you still have those moments and listen, I feel those things come up and I have to take a step back and be like, I'm checking out for a second because this is not, that's not what, I, that's not who I want to be. Cause that's, that's someone else. And so I'm going to just go meditate. I'm going to go be quiet. I'm going to go yep. take a nappy nap, something because it, it's a lot of work to work through that programmed response, you know? I One of the things I took away when I saw this, the blog that came out, and I, I watched your live where you were talking about the, the whole dead agent and all that, and I, I yeah. wanted you to describe it here for everyone who hadn't had a chance to see it. But the thing is, is one of the, where I think the major disconnect in it is, is that when Mike was in Scientology and he held his position there, mm -hmm. when he did a data, dead agent file, everybody had to believe it. Everybody lived by it. Correct. And I think that there's a certain mentality that I'm going to do this here and that's what's going to happen. And not right. realizing 90% of your audience are not former Scientologists and they don't, you don't just flip a switch with them like that. And I think that that's where this is really coming to bear on, on a lot of this. Mm -hmm. Something mm -hmm. else that you said that really rang with me and I really wanted to talk to you about it was how you were showing the graphs of the different levels and ranks within Scientology. Right. And how it seems as though it's conveniently hidden how there's a certain rank in there that keeps getting glossed over that we never hear about. Well, and <laughs> yeah, Mark put Mark was breaking down, you know, he was once again trying to like explain away what I was explaining because, you know, I'm just the little peon word clear. I don't know things. My entire job was explaining Scientology, guys. That was my job. But anyway, um, <laughs> so he put up all these graphics and like at one point it just started looking like it's sunny from Philadelphia when he has like all the strings all over the place, you know, right. And so he he kept showing the org board which is the organization board and, you know, like David Miscavige is at the top and he's showing all these other positions, but he kept leaving off like right under David Miscavige are all of the RTC reps. It goes David Miscavige RTC. And he didn't put L Ron Hubbard at the top, very out tech Mark, like no L Ron yeah, Hubbard source. But anyway, like, 
so squirrely. Anyway, but then you have David Miscavige. Right below him is is the deputy IG, right, and, and the other RTC reps. Okay, so and then come all the other people. Then come all the other people. Where was his wife? Where was Claire? Right there, right below David Miscavige. She was nowhere on the chart. Her picture never popped up. Like, we have to stop pretending. And there's a reason she gets called as an expert witness. Yes, because she was very trained. She knows a lot about Scientology. She can explain it in a very technical um, way. And she does not get rattled, guys. Why? Because she's still in the auditor mode. If you want proof of that, go watch the aftermath response to Aaron, where she's sitting this way, you know, staring, unblinking into the camera, auditing the entire audience about why Aaron was let go. That is the most, I mean, Claire went into full auditor mode for that video and just like fully put everybody in session for that moment. And I felt bad watching that because I thought, where are you going? Like, this is what happens a lot of times with ex org members. The trauma response, right, is to go back into your safety net of you're going to go into Sea org mode, right? Uh, you're going to go into this, like, flat, you know, <laughs> mode. And um, it, it happens with former military people, too. They just get into, like, you know, <laughs> mode and it happens a lot with ex org members especially who haven't done any work to talk about to dip their toe into their trauma um and for mark to just like pretend that his wife wasn't in rtc is like i it, it blows the mind that we're just gonna like pretend she wasn't there and it's not for me it, it, again and I've said this like three times now. I'm not trying to say that Claire Headley is a bad person. She's a mom. She's doing the very best job that she can. I believe that all these guys altruistically started the foundation and jumped into doing the foundation with the best of intentions. They all thought, you know what? We can give something back. We can help people. And in the further back of their mind, thinking, we did a lot of bad shit. Yeah. This is a way to make up for that. The and problem, I, I, but the I problem with that is, is that you haven't addressed yourself. Absolutely. First. You haven't addressed yourself first. It's nice to be like, you know, it's like those super rich guy who goes to work one night at the soup kitchen is like, well, I gave back. Yeah. Yay me. And you made sure to put it on your Instagram, your TikTok, right. your Twitter, I am or I'm sorry, kitchen. text. You know, make sure and on your Facebook too, along with your I'm vaccinated uh, but, yeah. icon there. You know, <laughs> that, to me, the reason why I thought it was <laughs> I thought it was so important to have you explain that was when we were talking earlier about the people who are coming out and are now being forced to go in front of people that they were they're terrified of right. to ask them for help. And I thought that that was important that we show the correlation there, why these people are terrified and why they, they look at these people almost as a mythical person that has been in their life, whether it be good or bad, this, these people held an extremely important, almost a deified position above mm -hmm. them in their mm -hmm. life for so long. And I, I thought that, you know, that was extremely important that people realize how bad that is for them and how yeah. hurting the, you know, you're already traumatized. You're already injured. Now we're going to just rub some salt in that wound by making you go to the people who may have been part of the traumatization that happened to you. Exactly. Exactly. And a lot and of people don't have yeah. the, the experience that I do, you know, with being a law enforcement officer, a lot of times I can read people and on how they're doing, especially with how their body is turned. And I always notice that a lot of times you'll see people, as you were discussing, turning to the side like that. That is, a lot of people don't realize that that's a form of aggression in and of itself. You turn your weak side of your body towards the person that you're dealing with. Mm. And the reason you do that is because, 
as they're paying attention to your face, they're paying attention to what you're saying, they're not seeing what you're doing with your strong hand. Man, if you ever see a fight, you'll notice people do that. They'll turn their, their weak side to another person, and then they'll come around from the strong side. So that, you know, a lot of people don't realize that that's not a form of, you know, I'm just trying to be stoic or whatever. That's a form of aggression trying to show dominance over someone else. Ah, yeah, and, that makes sense. That makes sense. Because yeah, you got to you gotta get your, you know, your rope-a-dope kind of like in there. You kind of. Oh, yeah. And that's the thing, (laughs) you know, and that comes from, you know, being, you know, military law enforcement and having been a professional mixed martial arts fighter myself. That's crazy. You start learning these things and you start seeing how people use them in everyday life and they'll do it without even knowing it. Oh, yeah. And that goes also into something I talk a lot about on on my channel is is something called muscle memory. Mm, Well, we mm -hmm. as law enforcement officers, we train hours upon hours upon hours how to reach for the holster, how to pull out, pull it out, how to pull it, bring yourself into position, how to bring the, the taser out, how to bring the pepper spray out. And you train on these hours and hours and hours so that when the time comes, you don't think about it. You You just just instantly go right into it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't realize that that does just, doesn't just carry into, you know, the physical realm of being forceful or having to take action on someone you do that day in and day out in something like the Sea Org, you're naturally going to fall into that. And it takes a yeah. lot of work to deprogram someone. It, it's a it's a daily, I mean, you know, I've been out since 2002 mm-hmm. and we're talking 22 years now, uh, come November. And it, it's still a daily thing. It's still a daily thing yeah. that I have to, um, you know, wake up every day and remind myself where I am. And remind myself that I am in my bed with my wife and I'm safe and everything is good. Um, I I think that's where having, you know, (laughs) a good partner in your life is so important. Oh, yes. I've talked about it numerous times about how in my early days as a law enforcement officer, I come home and the wife and I are talking. And at one point she looks at me and she goes, stop. Officer Poe stops at that door. That man who comes through that door is my husband. The badge doesn't make the man. The man makes the badge. And I'm not trying to be sexist or anything, but that's how she, that's what she told me. And I realized I'm turning into that same a-hole that a lot of the guys I didn't like that I worked with. I was turning into that. So I made it very personal to me to where I made sure that the officer Poe that you saw on the streets was the same John Poe who was out to lunch with his wife and his family. That's awesome. You know, and I think that that's what allowed me to be a more caring and compassionate law enforcement officer because I didn't look at it as this is my job. I'm here to arrest people. I'm here to enforce the law. I looked at it as I'm here to help and heal my community. And, you know, yeah, you've been arrested. That doesn't make you a criminal. It makes you someone who may have made a mistake, made a bad judgment in your life, but it doesn't make you a bad person. Yeah. And, I, you know, and that's why I am, you know, I think I have a much different look on law enforcement than a lot of the folks that you'll see who come out and they're just like, I'm a cop 100%. I'm stiff. I'm stoic. You're not going to get any emotion out of me, you know? But yeah, I, I mean, I think yeah. that just goes along with, you know, uh, people's yeah. different take on it. And it's the same thing. People coming out of the Sea Org, you know, um, a lot of people still want to wear the stolen valor uniforms and want to have the rank and rating. And that's part of the problem, too, is that, like, you know, I think a little bit, you know, and I am speaking for people and, you know, and I have been wrong and I've admitted that I'm wrong before, but the, the way these blog posts come across and these, uh, videos come across and, and Mm -hmm. everything else is that like, they still consider themselves executives and in charge and above us and ranking above us and more important. And it's like, you know what, we're not in the Sea Org anymore. We're not in the fake space Navy anymore. We don't um, salute you. We don't call you, sir. We don't um, have to, you're not the boss of us, you know, and we can uh, do what we want. um, And you have an obligation because you were at those seats at the table 
um, to use that information and privilege and power that you had to now that you're out and you decided, not us, you decided to start profiting off of that and speaking and forming foundations and doing this other thing, um, that you need to use that for good. And you need to use the information that you have access to, that you have to help people like Miriam who are seeking justice. Right. Now, I know Mike has been testifying um, in various cases, as has Claire. And I want them to continue doing that because there's a reason why lawyers don't come to me and say, hey, Nora, we'd love for you to be the expert witness. Number one, I'm too much of a character that people are <laughs> going to just be like, who is this crazy doodles? I like, think you juries know, would love you. Oh, juries would absolutely eat up every. They would be like, I have a question. I have more questions. You know, like, go, be, girl, go, go. It'd be like it a whole there. show. I'd be, you know, talking yep. to the judge. It'd be a whole thing. I would love it. <laughs> oh, I've gotten absolutely. in so much trouble for that. Don't. Oh, right. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't want to go to contempt yep. court. Like, no, thank you. But it, it, there's a reason why you know and i listen i will testify to whatever i know that's fine but there's a reason why claire and mike are picked because they did have that rank they did have access to things and knowledge that i don't have and i'm totally willing to admit that that's Absolutely. totally fine yeah. and in the same vein because he was brought up earlier mitch brisker worked for 30 years at the gold base which i never got to because I didn't have the clearance to go there to even know where it was, right. right? He sat there at the gilded table with David Miscavige eating his fancy food that was served to him by children slaves, okay? And then knew that the hole was going on behind him while he's filming these promo propaganda films for this, you know, disgusting leader guy, literally knowing that there's people being enslaved held captive yards away from where he's filming and he still cashed those checks. Now, I, I think it was great that you pointed out that uh, when Aaron was released and the way that I saw it was he shows up in the crowd talking about everything, but it seemed like it was more a sales pitch for his book or for his content that he was putting out. He That's even the titled the, the video shamelessly promoting yeah, my book. Exactly. Yep. And then he tried to like gaslight me in his response saying, well, that's not the whole thing. And it's just a couple of clips. Why did you title it that? Then? Why would you title it that if that's what it yep. was? And also people who were there, because I wasn't there. I wasn't actually physically there. I watched all of the lives. I stayed up late because I was like, Aaron's in jail. And my wife's like, people are there. They're going to handle it. I'm like, yep. I have to stay like glued oh my gosh, to my, my phone. I, oh I have a, I have a friend who he's going he's in stage four cancer multiple levels mm. and I had gone to the hospital I had to turn my phone off while I was there I got home turn oh oh crap my phone's off turn it on blew up my phone literally got heavier with all the messages that I got right and they're just like Aaron's in, under uh, he's in jail they, they arrested him what are you going to do and I'm like I live in Michigan he's in California what you're, you, you going to get on a helicopter and like come get yeah. him I mean like you can't that's that, that's crazy I mean I was watching I'm I, you know I'm just trying to like hold it down it was yeah. just it was insane and I'm just trying to send messages to people you should go talk to so and so are you doing this are you guys uh -huh. eating please eat like I'm trying to mom my friends that are there, you know, and oh, making yeah. sure they're okay. But it's like when he got released, it was like a whole, you know, like it was a definite party vibe over oh, there. Yeah. And then I saw that Mitch was there and he was literally like, at some points he wasn't filming. He wasn't on a live stream. So I actually, until I went to his channel, I was unaware that he had done any portion of a live stream at all. Um, because I just saw him on other people's live streams, just like, hi, I'm Mitch. Look at me. Here's my book thing. Yep. And that was his whole vibe the whole time. And it was just like, oh, no. Oh, yeah. Aaron and I made up. We're besties again. And I was like, what the what? Like what? And Aaron was like, I, whatever. You know, and he's just, <laughs> yeah. you know, Aaron was just like, bro, I spent four, you know, all these hours in jail. My wrists are still here. I don't care who's here right now. Like, great. You know, like he was just happy to be out. And they were in the middle yeah. of like doing that and just sort of trying to like. You know, I, I'm sure Aaron is still recovering from that. That's a traumatic Absolutely. experience. The and whole it, thing. I mean, he's going to court time. on Friday to deal with it, to deal with oh, the yeah. actual legal ramifications of that. So when you, when you think about the things you know, that they did to him, 
wanting to shackle him into a bathroom. Okay. You, what? Uh, yeah. That, you know, that's ridiculous. And the fact yeah. that, you know, they put him in handcuffs. You have an officer that is reading him his rights, but yet you have Iceman show up and oh, he's like, it. nope, stop. Get him out of here right now. No, yeah. you don't do that. If you're going to, if once you start Mirandizing someone, you finish it. Yeah, you can't because, stop that. Yeah. You can't stop that. I mean, listen, I've watched yeah. enough Law and Order to know, mm -hmm. like, you got <laughs> to not allowed follow. to watch Law and Order. You're not allowed to. You're <laughs> no. probably like, stop, dude, that's wrong. Yeah, no, that's, yeah. No, I, oh, I, 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 I'm obsessed with all the law shows. Like, I watch Jason Begay's show. I watch all the things, oh, like, yeah. you know. My I jokingly, wife, yeah, if she I doesn't let you watch room, those things. Yep. I walk into a room. My <laughs> wife's watching something like Law and Order, NCIS, CSI. Right. She looks, she looks at me and she's like, and no, just yeah, turns just it off. Turn off because all yeah. I do is I sit there and I pick everything apart. And a lot of people don't realize with these criminal TV shows that they're actually they're doing things because it has to be sensationalized. They're bringing right. in technology that doesn't exist. Also, they're shows. doing everything in a half an hour. I mean, like yep. the processes that they're showing you, even if they are real, right? Let's just hypothetically yep. say they're real. These processes would take weeks, sometimes months for this, yep. this data set to be collected and all yeah, this other absolutely. stuff. And like the collaboration between the police and the, the lawyers and, you know, the DA's office and all this stuff. Like one episode of Law and Order is crime, police investigation, uh, DA gets the thing, the prosecution, boom, done. Pow. Yep. Like. It is now, like, I um, will say, that takes like could take a year. Like yeah. I will <laughs> say law and order was probably one of the closest to reality sure. of how things go because they weren't out there like you'd see with the NCIS or CSI, they turn right. around and they here's this magical TV screen board that's the size oh, of a yeah. 30 foot wall. And they're like, well, I've got this. I've got that. No, that doesn't happen. I don't know very I many love departments that could ever stuff, afford though, that. The nerd stuff where they're yeah. like, hang on, I'm hacking something. I, I I absolutely loved Abby on NCIS. I she's thought she was the best character. She's the so, best character. Absolutely, absolutely the best. She just had to hack something. Yeah. And and that's kind of, you know, a lot of people don't realize that, you know, they, they see me, the former former soldier and the former police officer. But Abby was the kind of person that I hung around with growing up. That was yeah. the kind of people that they were free. They were like me. They were creatives. They were alternatives from the mindset of the get in line, do what you're told, and go to work. Yeah, that was that was the people that I liked. So I loved Abby. I thought she was amazing. No, I think um, she's fantastic. I she took was one my, of my favorites. I took my daughter to her fir first Pride Festival when she was 16 years old, and she was like, "Are you really going with me?" And I go, first off, you're driving an hour away from home to a festival." I've never been to, I've never heard of before. And you're going there with your friend. And most of the people that are going to be there are going to be adults. So mm -hmm. I am going to make sure everything's cool. I took her to that. I got back to work. I I got browbeat like you, you took your, you know what? I don't care. I'll swallow a spoonful of crap a day. If that's <laughs> what it takes to make sure my kids are health, healthy, happy. And they know that their father is always looking out for them. 100%. And, and I'll be 100% honest, not only was it the best food I've ever had at a festival, it was some of the most fun times I've ever had going to any kind of fair or festival. It was the most welcoming, open event that I've ever been to in my life. And I was just amazed by how it was. So, you know, I had no regrets whatsoever in doing that and being there with my children. And also my daughter learned, you can be who you are. I'm not ashamed of you. I love you for who you, you're my daughter. I love you no matter what. Yeah. I may get angry with you. I may get upset. I may be hurt by you, but you're my child and I love you. So, you that's know, all, that's all we all want to hear from our parents. I mean, like, let's be, yeah. let's be honest. I mean, and that's, I think that because it just to circle back to this whole Miriam thing, which started this whole snowball, it's like when we're dealing with something like this, that's so delicate that involved, her father right and then I, to get a father figure who's not following through in helping her that was you know the outrageous point and that's where you know as a as a fellow second gen you know it's just it, it, it's sort of like mary first of all miriam didn't ask me for any backup she didn't call me right. up she didn't say hey nora can you 
like just you know do a video i she didn't have to i was so it's just sort of like a trumpet call just happens mm -hmm. i was so outraged um by what had happened and i wanted her to speak first i wanted her to get her story out there she went on you know rabbit and they and they did what they did which i thought was brilliant mm -hmm. um and it, because she's so strong like she doesn't she doesn't need me to be her representative or speak for oh, her. Oh, goodness, no. That, that is one she's, strong, beautiful she's person. A, there. Yeah, she's amazingly strong. However, when it just got to a point where I just thought, um, I, I can't believe it's going in this direction, you know? like, yeah. And that's where we have to just shut it down. Um, you know, it's. It, it, I think it's, um, you know, at this point in, in, in the phase that we're at now, after the whole blow up with the aftermath foundation and the, the things that keep falling out from that, it's time for the era of truth. Like I made a joke Absolutely. that I'm in, I'm in my reputation era right now. And it's like kind of true. Um, it, we, we have to just keep the focus on putting as much truth out there as possible and Absolutely. keep the focus on getting Scientology's 501c3 status revoked and making sure that justice for people like Miriam, for the Jane Doe's that are still fighting, um, for Gavin Potter's victim who's fighting, for Leah who's in the middle of her lawsuit, um, for, for Aaron who's going to go to court on Friday, um, that these lawsuits and any future lawsuits that come from former, uh, you know, Scientology members, that those get the justice focus that they need. And for the people who have information that can help them in their quest for justice, come forward with those things. Because if you were in that position of power and you had access to that knowledge and you have that knowledge, it's time to put that forth on the table and focus it in the right direction because we have to get these kids out of Scientology. We have to keep, keep the fight there. And it's like Serge is, you know, every, every time there's a court day, he's out there pretty much alone, uh, confronting Robert Mangles, who's the lawyer for RTC for David Miscavige, um, very point poignantly. Um, and he needs some backup. He needs some backup out there to go, you know, people to go to the courthouse with him um, to do Absolutely. that because that's, you know, it's, it's one thing to go to the, the organizations, which I want people to keep doing. This is amazing to me that um, this is being shut down. And that was the other thing that happened. It was like this, you know, people say, okay, boomer, but I mean, you know, and boomers get a bad rap in this, in this instance, <laughs> but, <laughs> well. um, you know, it's, it's a little ageist, but it, 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 I think it's just, um, well, you know, tell like, you what, I spent three hours trying to helping. explain, I spent three hours trying to explain to my sister-in-law who was in her sixties, how to use, the remote control for her smart TV. Oh my so God. don't these know. things are getting crazy. They're out of control. <laughs> just just turn well, it on and do the things. Don't you and I are techies. Know. We love that kind yeah. of stuff. She has never had to do it. No, so. they can't. They we need to bring a dial back for oh, these yeah. people so they can just dial it and then I absolutely agree with what you're saying that there needs to be more and more lawsuits. And I think that someone else that isn't getting enough of the respect that they they deserve is Kelly Copter as yeah. well. Oh, Kelly is amazing. I Guys, mm -hmm. it, it came up in the chat here briefly, but she put out a new song today. If you haven't gone and give right. Kelly Copter yeah. some love for her new song that she put out, this woman, she's got some pipes on her. So talented. Uh, yeah. So amazing. And, and talk about somebody who's been fighting her whole life, um, you know, for uh, just a, a regular childhood. Kelly Copter. Um, what a, you know, I actually finally got to like speak with her yeah. Not, not just on the internet. And Was she's it like just, me about a three hour conversation? Right. <laughs> she's just so lovely. She's just such could, a lovely. We couldn't stop talking. A lovely, lovely person. I love yep. her. Um, and, and, and her contributions to everything, you know, have been, um, amazing. I think yeah. that, um, you know, a, a lot of the other thing that I want people to take into, um, account, um, because I get a lot of fan email. I do try to, um, you know, answer it as much as I can. But I, okay. I've had somebody email it, and I do email back and forth with people. And um, this person pointed out to me, you know, that they had, like, um, they're also, like, in the therapy world and stuff. But um, they pointed out to me that, um, you know, that I had, like, evolved 
over time from like my first videos to now. And they were like Absolutely. acknowledging this yeah. evolution. And it really, it really hit me hard because sometimes I, I, you know, really kind of like go inward and feel not great about, yeah. uh, you know, person, you know, you know, self a little poop and, um, you know, and, and, and I felt so like just seen, uh, in, in general, I feel seen by my audience and the people who tune into my lives and everything. I love you guys so much. Um, but, um, you know, having this person who had like seen pretty much everything I'd ever put out and, and having them notice what has changed in me from the first videos that I put out and what I'm doing now is like, yeah, I really have, like, I've come a long way, um, in yeah. terms of my own personal growth, in terms of my viewpoint on things and how I've evolved and stuff. And it's interesting because it's important to keep that in mind that that's what needs to keep happening. Right. Like when I first came out, I was pissed. I was oh, yeah. so angry. And they, not that I don't get angry about stuff now, like this thing with Miriam really kind um, of like it, as, as Marilyn would say, it burnt my biscuits. And when people come from Marilyn, <laughs> there's another that's one, a, Marilyn. That's, it, 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 here's a darling yeah. woman who, you know, uh, she's a fellow cult survivor, not Scientology, uh, you know, different cult who yeah. just found a kinship with us here in um, ex Scientology land. And it, for some reason, and this again is like a classic OSA uh, office special affairs op where they, they try to find the weak link. Right. And yep. someone has decided in OSA land that Marilyn is our Achilles heel, that if they get to Marilyn yep. and they just like chop her up, that they're, that, that, that's that gonna be a, she, they're going to put her head on a pike. It's called yeah. head on a pike in Scientology. They're going to put her head on a pike. And then that's the message to the rest of us. Like they used to do back in the old West, old times, you know, like that scene in game of Thrones where people come into uh, the, whatever place and they'd see all the heads on the walls. Yep. That's head on a pike. So, you know, uh Oh, uh Oh, hot dog. Like I better not mess around in here or my head's going to be on that wall. Right. So yep. Marilyn's going to be the head on the pike for us. And then we're all going to fall in line and be like, Oh no, don't destroy me. Like you destroyed oh, Miss Marilyn. Oh no. You know, like oh, yeah. that's not going to happen. Number they one, because she was, she sounds so meek and so soft and just so I'm all about love. They didn't yes. realize you would rather sandpaper a tiger's ass than take that woman on. She no, is don't. no joke. Don't mess no. with, don't mess with Miriam and don't mess with Marilyn. Okay. Yep. But also like we love Marilyn Absolutely. and we will, we will we'll circle the wagons to be like, you can't mess with our Marilyn. Like we have adopted her into our group. And when you mess with her, you're messing with us. So we're going to, we're going to be like, bro, you can't, no, we're not going to, not today, not on this Chipper yeah. Wednesday. We're not going to do that. So it, it keeps happening though. It just oh, keeps yeah. happening. And I keep trying to tell people like it, it, you're picking the wrong one. They tried with the ZDT with me for eight months. It didn't work. I didn't, I'm still here. I'm still here. Um, you know, and, and, and the truth of the matter you, is all these ops have one goal in mind and that's to crush us. And to stop us, us from just to turn off the channel, just to yep. throw it away, delete the videos and it, erase yourself from the internet. Because if we did that, that's the real win for, for OSA. Like everyone says, oh, you're going after Mike and you're going after Mitch and you're going after Claire. OSA's celebrating. They're not celebrating Jack Shinola. Why? Because I'm revealing their playbook. I am showing what's, what's under the hood. They are freaking out. They are not yeah. happy that I have those documents. They're not happy that we have all these things, that we're going to just start telling everybody what they've been doing for all these years. They are not happy. Number well, two, I am gay. They don't want me. They're not celebrating me. Are you joking? And if they if, if they are, uh, listen, I will show up next Friday at the HTB and I will, listen, you can cut me a paycheck. Like I could use them. I got four kids. Okay. Yeah. Like, I will, you know, supposedly I'm being paid by Eli Lilly too. I don't get that paid. Where is that paycheck going? I could use it. Dear well, Pfizer, it, dear Eli Lilly, you guys hit me up. It's it's like they're they're doing it for the clicks and for the monetization. If they realized how much money you don't make off YouTube, oh. 
you know, I wish. Yeah, I wish. I mean, it's like, yes, there are some people and this is the other thing. Well, why should somebody make money? And it's not nice to make money when you're talking about. First of all, that's a bunch of BS. If a person A left Scientology and they set up a successful YouTube or they set up a successful TikTok and they're talking about Scientology stuff and they're cashing, making bag. I'm like for real clapping for them. <laughs> Good job. What that yep. tells me is, A, you're a successful business person. B, you know how to create great content. And C, Good job, capitalism. Okay, like we should all be cashing in money checks to talk about this stuff. Whatever. There's people on the internet right now, guys, doing mukbang. Okay, they're just setting up huge tables of food and eating it. And that is making money. Who cares? Who cares? And then people are like, well, if, you know, like this was a comment I got, oh, if Aaron's making all this money, why, why isn't he giving it to, to Miriam? And I was like, okay, because we are all like left Scientology, we are not indebted to each other for anything. Okay. Like, yes, we're talking about, I talk about Miriam. I've talked about various people. I, I don't owe Miriam money. I don't owe Leah money. I don't owe Aaron money. I don't owe Serge money. Um, yeah. I want all of them to get money. I will help Miriam get the, the treatment that she wants. I will send resources her way. I will put up the links for well, whatever me... she's doing. But to, to tell somebody, to tell anybody that just because we came from the same group that now somehow I have to open my wallet yeah. and do this, that's, that's silly. I've, you know, I reluctantly put up PayPal. Did you hear then, Jamie though. Mustard talk about that with Rabbit today? Yeah. Yes. I think he did a great job explaining that, but I want to show you something. He's so that... eloquent. He's so eloquent. Yeah. He's, he, oh, he's he smarter than so much... Whip. And he's, yeah. He's he, amazing. He and I just think, you know, it's like, it, it's 2024, guys. This is the new commerce, e-commerce, mm -hmm. all this other stuff. And if people want to gift money, they want to, somebody just gifted some memberships in your chat. If yes, people want to do stuff like that, I love it. I yep. love it. It's fantastic. And you don't have to. And right? Every, it's, every it's a dime choice. that I get in from this all goes into equipment to help do this right. better, to give you better content. 100%. I've got a pension, and I tell people all the time I had someone say, I wish I could get a membership, but money's tight. And I'm like, don't worry about it. Just I, you watch. know, the, yep. The fact that you're here <laughs> is more important to me than buying a membership or anything. But don't right. think that the folks who gift the memberships, I, I absolutely love that because not only are you showing support, but you're helping other people in the process. Right. On that topic, if you look down at the bottom of the screen, we are putting it together. I've talked to Miriam. Boom. And yes, I know I spelled her name wrong because I'm <laughs> stupid. I've had too you, many hits to you, the head. But you but you spelled but, it right once and then you spelled yeah. it wrong in the other place. Because so you I type it right. faster than I think. That's my problem. But we are putting together a chatathon for Miriam to make it. sure she, she raises the rest of the money. We are not touching that money. Right. We're going to set it up so when you give, that money goes right to a PayPal, Venmo, any of that stuff. That, you know, it goes directly to Miriam. We're not touching any of it. We want her to receive that money. And I don't want anyone to sit there and go, well, you got all this money. Why didn't, where did it go? No, it's going straight to her. I don't want a hand in any of it. That's I'll amazing. be there to help her, support her and help raise the money for her. Yeah. But I sure as heck am not going to touch any of that money. I want her to have it. And also and, like she's in Australia guys. Yep. Like I've never been to Australia. I would love to go to Australia just to visit Miriam and give it's her a really gigantic cool. hug and just, you know, be yeah. like, let me make you a meal because that's the, that's the kind of person I am. If you're down yeah. and out and you're not feeling good or you're just having a hard time, I'm going to come make you some food because I'm Greek and that's what we do. We just fix things with food. Uh, I'm hillbilly um, and we do the same thing. So, right. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, that's, that's, that's how you fix stuff. You just uh, set up the barbecue and uh, make the meat and uh, some good sides and then everything's great. Um, but yeah, you know, um, I, I'm 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 so happy. What what I love though is that the majority of people, even people who are like diehard Mike Render supporters, are still like, "You got to fix this with Miriam." Yeah. 
So it's like people can see through even well, you've this got, moment. You've got someone who's who's trolling gotta, right now in your chat. That oh, is, I know. I, I, I don't. I, 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 who is who is it this time? Selfless self with this stupid stuff they're putting up there. Oh, um, ugh. you know, let me taking things out of context. Of course, I, I'm always open for, you know, I, I, I try to look, debate. but I also, I'm, I get so yeah. into the conversation that I don't really look at the chat. I apologize. I don't oh, know. That's all right. Um, yeah, they did a super on yours and oh, did they say they, something stupid? Oh, they're saying that I was having a discussion with Aaron and I was discussing the differences between SA to a teenage female and a teenage boy. And mm. how there are certain things that have to happen for a teenage mm. boy to, but they're they're looking they're just taking it up taking it out of context and they're using it a different way. I'm op open to open debate, open discussion about things, but right. don't take bits and pieces of what I say and try to use that as a I got you. Someone put in there, did you lock people up for owning a piece of uh, a piece of weed? Did I do my job as a police officer? Yes, I did. When weed was illegal in your city, yeah. in your in your jurisdiction, you had to. That's you not a, that's most a silly. Time, unless you had a, a friggin' block of it. Break that stuff up and throw it in the in the gutter. Yeah, I'd rather I'd know. rather you just you just break it up and throw it away than have to take you in and for the rest of your life have a narcotics arrest on your record. Right. But, you know, people are like, oh, well, because you did that, you put them in cages. Well, that's what a jail is. It's essentially a cage. Right. You know, I'm sorry. I mean, this... weed hasn't always been legal, guys. No. You know what I mean? And it really, it, 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 that is a, that is a, it, it's really a jurisdiction by jurisdiction thing. Absolutely. And an officer by officer thing. And this is what I tell my kids because, you know, they've just started driving and things like that. And, um, you know, I've had many different police interactions in my life for various different reasons in the church, out of the church, in my car, you know, in, in, in different yeah. scenarios. And your best bet in any scenario, whether you've been pulled over or you're in a group that's causing trouble or whatever, yeah. is to be nice. It doesn't matter your opinion of police. It doesn't matter, like, whatever. Mm -hmm. If you're there to protest the police, what? Be nice nice because politeness and like manners will nine times out of 10 help you in most situations. And that is what I try to tell my kids. Like it, it, it doesn't matter. And that goes for everything in life. And Johnny Meyer, no, I don't look back and regret on it. Yeah. Like I said, yeah. I would it's rather like, have guys, someone. It's not yeah. yeah, that's I, I don't think you should. I don't think you should because it's yeah. when you're an officer of the law, you have to follow the laws in your jurisdiction. And I don't think anybody should should and, feel bad about enforcing the laws that were laws at that time. And There's Joe, Joe's saying it right. I don't but, yeah. make the laws. No. All right. No. I tried to show as much discretion and compassion as possible. Yeah. But the yeah. fact is, is that I, you know, I had a job to do. And if I didn't do my job, then the fact is I could lose my job. 100%. So it wasn't, it wasn't a matter of, I didn't like, I, I always hated the fact that it was illegal. Absolutely yeah. hated it. I never thought it should Most have been listed like Most law enforcement officers that I knew did yep. because it was a waste of their time to be, you know, arresting people for what was stupid. And not things that were, um, you know, important, yep. it, like a, a domestic disturbance where someone's being harmed that would really need your attention um, and things like that, where it's just some kid smoking pot in the Taco Bell parking lot where yeah, it's like, you know, I'm like, who come cares? On who yeah, cares? I, the, the thing is, is that and exactly uh, like coffee and first, please, you know, we just dump it. All right. Yeah. I, I, it's not a matter of I, I wanted to. I, I explained how a kid threw a knife in the air because he was trying to throw it away so that we didn't see him with a knife. He was afraid he was going to get busted for having this knife on him. The knife landed right here. It went straight up and came straight down into my shoulder. I literally got into a fist fight with one of our detectives because he wanted to charge the kid with attempted murder. 
when I, I realized this kid was scared. He was trying to get rid of it. And when he went to throw it, it slipped and yeah. it went straight up and came right down in my shoulder. Yeah. It hurt like, like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> but he didn't mean to hurt me. It wasn't his intention. If he had tried to throw it at you, it would have gone nowhere. Let's be honest. Yeah. Like if he had, if he had tried to do, you know, like a, like a throw, yeah. it would have gone. Would've done it it would have, no, it would have gone nowhere. There's no, yeah. there's like a bajillion to one chance of that happening. And it happened. And it's just like, that's, you know, and, and because you're a reasonable person, yeah. you didn't, you know, and that's what happens in, in some know, scenarios, you know, that we read about on the news. Oh, yeah. The detectives are looking at it like, oh, this kid tried to kill. No, he didn't. No. He was a 19-year-old kid who made a mistake. Yeah. And they told me, don't go back to the police department. You can't go. But, you know, you need to stay away from where I said, no, I got to go talk to this kid. I got to find out what's going on. So I went in. I opened his jail cell. I walked in. I sat down. I said, look, you need to tell me what happened. Why? Why did you yeah. do this to me? I said, this isn't for the case. This isn't for prosecution. I just want to know the truth. The kid's sitting there crying and he goes, the, the fact is, is that my, you know, I, I thought you guys were going to arrest me if you found it on me. And I went to throw it and Aww. it slipped out of my hand and I go, okay, no problem. And I literally got into a fist fight with one of our detectives because he's like, no, this kid's going away. No, you're not ruining a 19 year old kid's life for a mistake. I'm that fine. Crazy. All right. Yeah, it hurts. And I'm I guess what? I just got a, about a three week vacation paid for and I'm going to go hang out with my family. So, you know, I, I had to find some kind of positive in it because I could not see her harming this young person. And to this day, I get Christmas cards from him every year. I get phone <laughs> calls from him all the time and he's doing great. He has a great job. He's working. He has a family now. And that's the thing is that you know, people look at cops and you hear the, the statement, a cab, all cops are B. Well, the fact is 99% of us aren't. No. And, and I, and I think know. that, you know, there's been a lot of stuff, um, that's happened recently that, you know, it paints, uh, you know, officers with one brush and that's, that's unfortunate. Um, yeah. you know, and a, yeah. You know, and in, in, in hopefully a, a lot of police departments, you know, are doing a lot to try and, you know, work on uh, training and other things, which I think is super important. We and it does come down to that. You know, it comes down to training and it comes down yeah. to, uh, you know, really Support. getting to know the, citizen, the citizenry that Absolutely. they are a part of and I, not just, you know, um, th yeah. like the thing that we're talking about here. This yep. rank and rating and like being above everybody kind of a thing, because the truth of the matter is there's a there's a phrase that's usually on police officers cars that says to protect and serve. And when I was a kid and I saw that to me, that meant that police officers were there to to help. And uh, as cool. as Mr. Rogers would say, they were they were helpers. Right. And I yeah. think that um, sometimes people take that in a different way, you well, know, and anytime and, and, there's a position just, of authority there, yeah. there will be people who, who want to buck against it. I mean, I've been one of those where I, I hate government. I hate authority, mm -hmm. but that's from many years of having to work within it and seeing the corruption that goes on far above the base police officer. I'm talking yeah. the, the politicians and all that. And the bureaucrats who are the ones that are reaping in, all of the benefits from it. But, you know, the thing is, is, and I, I'm, I'm sorry, we're getting, I'm taking you guys way off topic, but the fact is, is it, it travels over in here too. Like you were saying, there yeah. was a rank and file in there. And a lot yeah. of folks think that they come out with that rank and file and we mm -hmm. all have to fall in line with it. Yeah. Well, and that's sorry. not the way life is. I mean, <clears throat> you know, unfortunately there is kind of a caste system in life. Right. Um, and you know, we're experiencing in the SPTV world, a little bit of what happens with, um, societies every once in a while things get shook up and it's usually, yep. um, you know, the lowest cast, the people at the bottom who rise up as, as you know, the famous line in the Hamilton song, rise up to, uh, you know, uh, cause the ruckus and, uh, you know, uh, yep. make the change. And so that's what's happening right now. There's some changes. Everything is going to settle 
everything is going to get focused on what needs to happen. And we're, we're going to, you know, keep doing what we've been doing, which is, you know, taking this church monolith uh, down piece by piece, because it's not a one and done. This what do you is, think would happen you know, if if they actually came out and said, look, we hear what you're saying. Mm. And I'm talking about the Aftermath Foundation. We hear sure, what sure, you're sure. saying. We're going to be transparent and we're going to take a lot of the recommendations. We're going to break the board up. We're going to bring people in who are second mm -hmm. gens or whatever they, they want to be known as. And we're also going to bring in people who have never been in so that we have a unbiased board that doesn't seem to have a whole lot of connection between all of them. Mm -hmm. And how do you think that that would, would help with their view in the public? Mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, um, my personal thing is, um, I think that people who have been in Scientology, who have uh, been touched by Scientology, should be more in a advisory role um, and more of a, like, let me translate these things for you. Let me make sure that you're understanding the needs of the person um, and the people that you're going to be addressing. Right. And sure. for that, I think you need at least one or two, like, I don't know how many board members are usually on a charity to be honest. Mm -hmm. Um, but like, let's say you have 20 board members total. Okay. Like let's just throw a ridiculous number out there. If you have 20, two of them could be like ex Scientologists. The other 18 should have nothing to do with Scientology. They should be made up of a, you know, a spectrum of life and you've got to have some trauma informed people. Um, on there to absolutely um, really uh, be able to view this with a clear lens and make sure that all things are being dealt with with that. Because that's a, that's a phrase that didn't even exist like four years ago, trauma-informed. Um, so that's a very new thing, but it is something that is super, super, I you know, important. Now, this is also like – this is my brainchild. This is not something that the new foundation is doing. Okay. Right. But my personal thing is, and, and you, you brought this up earlier. So I want to circle back to a point you made. Okay. You asked the other guests you had, like, what's their favorite thing or the thing that they like the most from having been in Scientology and they cross right. the board work ethic. So the problem when you first leave the Sea Org is that you've, you've never really taken a vacation. You, you, you don't know how to take a break. You don't, you haven't slept in years. Um, you don't know how to rest anymore. Um, you haven't really eaten uh, a, a real meal or properly. Or oh, beans um, and rice aren't a meal? No. I mean, it took me because I was on the RPF for almost three years, guys. Um, it took me many years to stop eating like I was in prison because mm -hmm. we had 20-minute meal breaks. Um, so I would like put my arm in front of my food and just like furiously eat. Um, Absolutely. and so it takes me, it took me a long time to like learn to savor my food and chew and like, you know, just relax and not look like an animal, um, when I was eating. And I'll so, tell you, I did the same thing when I came out of the army because, right? because you're you're just going like, through, yep, you got to get it in, get it done, get it quick. Go, 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 go. So yep. my idea, um, <laughs> is like, I think that honestly, there should just be like a ranch um, that oh, is a peaceful place. Maybe there's, you know, it, it is beautiful luxury. There's just like, there's some horses or something you can pet. There's yeah. just, you know, everything you need. There's a chef. Uh, maybe there's some people to give you a massage, but you literally come there to do nothing like you're not there to figure out your job you're not yep. there to figure out like therapy you're not there to do any of that because we're not going to get into the business of creating like a narconon or a new psychiatric hospital or something like that this is like this is the 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 ground zero you just go and you're just going to sleep for however long yeah. you need to sleep you missed all of friends because you were on the rpf watch all of friends whatever yep. just do whatever, just relax. And then when you're like, oh, I, I feel rested. 
Like I've, I've eaten food. Like yeah. I, wow, this is earth. This is, this is the planet. Now, maybe you could start thinking about like, do I want to, maybe I could get in touch with my family. Maybe I could, what, what could I do for a job? Then that's when all the other resources of said foundation would come in to be like, now we're going to walk you through the steps to exist in the real world. Because you probably, maybe you were born into it. You don't know. You've never been in the real world. Or maybe you yep. left the real world and now you got to come back. We'll help you come back. And whatever. Or maybe you're like me and you've been out in the real world and now you've just started dealing with your trauma. Okay? Because you started watching SPTV or you watched Leah's yep. show finally. And now all your trauma that you've been hiding in a, in a box in the back of your brain is now just, just shit all over your face. And now you're like freaking out. You could go to that place too. And just now you need to just chill out. It's all of that. Um, you know, I, I think that's a beautiful point. And I think that Miriam is a great example of that. You know, she'd come out and they say, well, life. we helped her. We did this for her. Well, there are underlying traumas that mm -hmm. are going to come out that have to be dealt with as well. And I think that an ongoing plan to help these folks is very important. And that's, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. something we, we need to look at for that. So, Nora, I have had an absolutely wonderful time with this. Absolutely. I think you are an amazing person. We're coming up on two hours, and I know we Liv gotta, wants to go back live again. I know. Um, and I got to and I gotta walk my dogs gotta, and get ready You got for a bed. family, too. You got to take care I've of. I got four kids, yes. Yeah, we're empty nesters now. But I would love to have you back on and absolutely. continue this discussion. I think we have so much that we could really play off of each other during these discussions. I think that it would be excellent to continue this at another point. Um, any closing thoughts you've got for everybody out there? I, you know, uh, anybody who wants to go out and help surge out in front of the courthouse, go do that. All of the TikTokers, uh, now turned YouTubers, uh, Jessica <laughs> streets, uh, LA cam, confidence chris chris without a hellcat all of these guys you guys are amazing uh please keep it up uh you know defender of ants all these guys lara fm who's out there every day yep. um i'm so proud of everybody i'm so excited to be down there uh, a week from friday so oh, with with awesome. liz with both the liz's liz squared and <laughs> alicia from degraded daughters so uh you know it's gonna be amazing we're gonna um we're gonna we're gonna rock it. It's gonna be awesome. I can't wait to live stream from. Uh, we have an update on stomping ground on, on Chris and how he's doing from his injuries from his attack. Um, the last live I saw from him is that he's 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 recovering. So okay. hopefully, uh, still met on the men there. Well, we wish him the and best. And don't forget Pearl Snappy. I'm sorry. See, I forget <laughs> people. I'm sorry. I don't want to forget people. All these people are doing amazing work, yeah. and people around the country too. Like you know, it's just uh, it's growing every day. So and let's keep know. Aaron in our thoughts with his upcoming legal battles as well. I know. So, we got to yeah. keep it, keep it going, keep it going. And thank uh, you for having me on John. Oh, I, no, I, I have loved this. I really appreciate it. Um, folks, like I said, we, I am well more than open to open discussion and, and debate on things. Um, this, you know, keep, keep it civil. Don't bit and piece things together. Don't cherry pick what you want to, what you want to use against someone. You know, if that's, completely against the whole point of being an open and honest debate. We need to start focusing on things. As Nora said, we need to think about these people who are coming out who are so damaged and traumatized by this horrible organization. Yeah. And we have to remember that, you know, yeah, just because you helped them when they immediately came out, doesn't mean that's the end of the road for it. We have to continue with this. We have to keep looking at these folks. We have to make sure that they're okay if we don't do that, who's going to do it for us? And, exactly. you know, it, it may sound selfish, but that's the truth of life is that's one of the reasons why we have families, why we have children, because we can't do everything on our own. So we should always be willing to put that hand out there and help someone else. And as always, folks, life is short. You get one shot, make it count.